All right, hi there. Today I thought I'd talk about something a little bit different than radios and talk a little bit about what I do for a living and thought maybe some things that you might be interested in that I could share with you. Um, what you see before you here is a conventional x-ray tube out of a uh, hospital x-ray machine. And I thought I'd go a little bit over on some theory of how x-ray works and how an x-ray tube specifically works. So I try to keep it a little bit simple. Um, some of you who have some electronics background, I'll have some things that may you may be able to pick up on rather quickly. And for those of you who don't have as much electronics experience, I'll give you a little bit of uh, information that may help you to understand a little bit about how this works also. So let's start with something here that may be more familiar to some of you. If you look here, this is uh, just a standard vacuum tube. All right? And uh, for those of you who may be into electronics, especially vintage electronics, you'll recognize this as a 5U4. And if you look, there are two elements in here. Each one is an actual diode tube. Okay? Uh, it's called a 5U4. The 5 stands for a 5-volt filament. The U is a designator for the factory, and 4 means there are four elements in this. Um, your two filaments and your two plates. Okay, so it's a basic diode, anode and cathode, two of them in here. Now, if you look at the uh, diagram here, we have a little schematic. You'll see like a schematic drawing of this. And basically what you see is your two anodes, or your plates, and your two cathodes, or your filaments. And this is what we call a direct heated tube. Direct heated means that the filament itself is the cathode. So it's the filament and the cathode both at the same time. As opposed to other tubes that have an indirect heated cathode, meaning the filament heats another element that element is what gets hot and gives off the electrons and allows current to conduct. Now we know that a diode will conduct in one direction but not in the other. Okay, So that's what normally what we use a diode for is to, con is to convert AC to DC. All right. Now what's inside this housing Go over a little bit is basically the same thing. You have an anode and you have a, a directly heated filament or cathode. Okay, It's shaped a little bit different. We'll get into that here in a little bit, why it looks like that. But basically inside this metal housing that's all lined with lead, we have an anode and a cathode, just like your regular radio diode tube. Okay. Now, we don't use x-ray tubes as diodes, even though that's what they are and that's what they do. But there's another property, and this is what we take advantage of in this industry, and that is whenever we work with a tube, when you heat up this filament, okay, we get something around there that we call an electron cloud. So you got all these little electrons and the heat combined with the tungsten in there or whatever material that's made of, what we say it burns off electrons. That's not really what's happening but just bear with me. Okay. So these electrons are now what we call excited. They're able to jump once there is enough negative charge in here and enough positive charge up here, these electrons will start to move from the cathode to the anode. Okay? Of course, they're moving at or near the speed of light. Okay? So you can imagine, even though an electron is such a tiny little particle, subatomic particle, it's still going to have some form of energy when it strikes that plate. Now, when it strikes that plate, several things happen. But one of the important things in our industry that happens 
is you create a photon, okay? It's an X-ray photon. Now we know that we describe light, visible light, as a photon, and an X-ray is the same thing, only at a higher energy and a higher wavelength, okay? So if you look on the radio spectrum chart, you'll see audio, audio sounds, then as we go up in the kilohertz range and above, we get into RF, and then after about 300 gigahertz, we get beyond the RF, or radio frequency spectrum, we start getting in, into our ultraviolet, infrared, visible, all the, the lights, and then as we pass beyond that visible light, we pass into the X-ray spectrum, okay? So it is radiation, all right? Now, I would be remiss if I didn't speak to this, but understand this is only for entertainment purposes, and you should never ever try to work with one of these or mess with one of these unless you're a trained, en trained engineer on these. You really need to understand how it works. It's very dangerous. These work with very high voltages, and they also produce radiation. So this is not a toy, and it's not something to be played with, but it is interesting. Okay, so one of the things that we found is that people don't realize this, but every tube will make at some point, in some point, will produce some form of radiation. The only thing is these little tubes, you're not accelerating them at high enough potential, so this tube's going to have four or five hundred volts on it. Now, 400, 500 volts is not really enough to produce enough radiation that it could even have enough energy to penetrate the glass envelope of the tube. So, even if this is making radiation, it's never going to get outside this little glass tube. Now, when we start accelerating it at higher voltages, like in an old picture tube of a television, we're on the magnitude of 30 kV or 30,000 volts. That is enough energy that the radiation does have enough energy to penetrate the glass. In the old days, televisions didn't have much shielding on, on the front of them, and the radiation could get out. If you were close enough, you could be exposed to radiation. The old saying that your mother says, don't stand too close to the TV, it'll hurt your eyes, that's true because your eyes were being exposed to radiation and your eye is actually the most delicate sensitive organ in your body when it comes to radiation exposure. So basically x-rays were discovered and of course we, we attribute that to a man by the name of Wilhelm Rankin. Okay, Wilhelm Conrad Rankin. And Mr. Rankin was experimenting with tubes that had a high potential or high voltage applied to them. And he wasn't the first person to work at tubes with high voltages, with very high voltages. But he was the first to discover this phenomenon that there is some extra energy that was being released by the tube that he couldn't explain. And this radiation or this ray was unknown. It was an X-ray, and that's how it got its name, X-rays. And the bottom line is, it was exposing film that was sealed in a light, tight packaging, but it could still expose the film somehow. And he deduced that that radiation, or that X-ray, must have some sort of property to where it can penetrate an opaque object. So it propagates through through material differently than visible light does. So after experimenting with it, he did determine that yes, x-rays can penetrate, but there's other things that happen. Okay, x-rays have two properties that we work with. One is the ability to penetrate an object. The other is when the object absorbs the radiation. Now, it's the absorption that we worry about. When x-ray is absorbed, it causes damage to tissue, okay? So it has to interact with you to be absorbed. 
the problem, so you might say then why don't we turn it up till it all penetrates? Well, how does an x-ray work? How do we see an image? If I take my hand and I place it in front of the x-ray tube, if I turn it up too high, all the x-ray will pass through my hand and I won't see my hand. I will only see the radiation striking the film or, or the image detector. If I turn it too low, it all gets absorbed by my hand and I get a blank image. But if I turn it up just right, okay, Goldilocks and the three bears, the dense tissue, which is bone, will absorb the radiation, but the soft tissue, skin, will pass the radiation through or it will penetrate through. And what this will do is cast a shadow of your bone. That's really all x-ray is doing, okay? It's a balancing act between penetration and absorption. All right, and that's what we're doing. Now, a little bit more about how this thing works. If you look at our little diagram again, you'll see a few things here. This is a modern tube. The old x-ray tubes looked almost like that 5U4. The very simple, a filament and a little piece of metal for the target, which was your anode. But the problem is, when you take an electron beam and accelerate it at very high energy to that target, it won't take long before that'll turn white hot and melt and burn right through. So you really can't produce any high energy radiation when you have a stationary anode. So what we're doing here is this is a motor much like a squirrel cage motor, like a fan motor. And it's inside the glass envelope of the tube. And inductively, we put a stator coil around it. So inside here is a stator coil, and this stem is inside that stator coil. And we rotate this disc. We spin it very fast, anywhere from 3,500 to 10,000 RPMs. And what it does is it spreads that heat across this whole great big heavy piece of metal, and therefore, we don't overheat our target. And we can get a lot more energy out of this tube than if we didn't move the anode. So that's all this is. This whole thing here is an anode, but it's a rotating, spinning, moving anode. This is our filament cup. And really this little cup holds the filament. The filament runs on 12 volts. It actually is very similar to an old-fashioned headlight from a car. It's very similar characteristics, size-wise, thickness-wise, current-wise, so forth and so on. And if you look here, these are the three leads that go to your filament. Now you might say, why are there three? Well, there's a large filament and a small filament. And I'm not really going to get into why we have two different filaments, but uh, it has to do with the larger filament can handle more energy, the smaller filament handles less energy, however the small filament can make a finer beam, the larger filament makes a coarser beam, so if you want to look at great detail, you use the small filament, if you want to look at, if you want to penetrate a larger object, you use the big filament, so that's really in a nutshell what that does. So let's look at some of the parts of this tube. First of all you'll notice this tube is a big metal cylinder and it's steel on the outside or aluminum and it's lined with lead so the lead actually will block the radiation from escaping from the tube if we look up here oh, it's heavy and you look inside here let's see if we can zoom in you can actually see see if we can get some light on there. See that little silver, this part right here? That's actually the rotor. Okay, and you can't really see it, but right across from that rotor, you can also see, you would be able to see the filament. Very hard though, because it's kind of down inside the oil and it's kind of dark inside there. Up here, you have your two high tension wells. And if you look inside here, you'll see three little pin receptacles. Okay, and they're way down in there, about six inches down. And what those do, 
is, if you notice, it's kind of greasy down in there. We actually use a special dielectric paste, and it basically insulates that high voltage from getting out of the pins and shorting up to ground. The whole tube is grounded. Okay. Now, I'm going to show you something you may not believe, but it's true. It might be upside down, but... KVP rating 150 maximum. Yes, you're seeing it. This x-ray tube can handle 150,000 volts. And you might think, well, it's like a neon sign, real low amperage. Well, I got news for you. These tubes, this one here at 150,000 volts can easily handle 300 milliamps or a third of an amp at 150,000. The bigger tubes that you see on CAT scanners and big equipment like that can handle that 150,000 at over one amp. That's a lot of power, 150 kilowatts. So this is not a toy and the equipment that runs it is definitely not a toy. Very dangerous. So. Let's look a little bit on the inside here. One side there's a little bit to see, the other side there's not a whole lot to see. Oh, and I forgot. Inside this housing you have your stator and you have your tube, but you also have the tube is filled with oil, dielectric oil, okay? And no, it is not PCB, it's actually Shell Diala type oil. And it's got a very high di dielectric property. It helps insulate that tube and the high voltages inside there from the housing so it doesn't arc. That's why it doesn't short out when you make an exposure. If you look on this side, you have a rubber bellows. And that bellows pressurized in there. All of the air is evacuated from this housing and replaced with oil. It's not under vacuum pressure, but it's oil has displaced all of the air. If there's even one air bubble in there, the tube is ruined and it could short out an arc under high voltage. And if you notice this bellow, it's actually in there for a reason. As the tube heats up and this thing will get hot, the oil inside will expand. If this didn't have any, if it didn't have anywhere to expand, the tube would burst. So this actually will, will come out as it heats up. It'll actually balloon out as the air, as the oil expands with the heat, and then it'll collapse back down as it cools. Okay, so that's kind of a safety measure. So let's put this back together. I'll be right back in a second. Okay, now if we look at this side of the tube, this is the anode side, and there's a couple things here. There would normally be a cable that comes in through this little clamp, and it'll have three conductors, and this is a standard stator winding. So you have your phase winding right here, which would go to your startup capacitor, just like in a, in a blower motor. You have your common winding, which is ties the two coils together of the stator, and you have your main winding, which is this black wire. So main phase in common, just like a normal squirrel cage motor. Over here you have a little thermal cutoff switch. That goes down to the x-ray machine. If this gets too hot, this opens up and it prevents the x-ray machine from energizing. That's what it's in there for. It's another safety that they have in there. Now, if we look at the front, we looked at that port. The only place that x-ray comes out of this tube is this little port here. And if you notice these bolts, bolt holes here, this is how the tube mounts to the system. And there's a lead box that mounts on the front of it with metal lead shutters that can open and shut. And that's called your collimator. It collimates the x-ray down to the size of whatever anatomy you're trying to x-ray. Again, safety. We don't want x-ray going anywhere but where it needs to go. Now, if we look inside here, you see this little square. This is just a little lead cup to help 
cut it down a little bit again to collimate the size and something that I get asked all the time <laughs> this is different from the kind of radiation you're used to hearing about it's not radioactive radioactive means the object emits radiation naturally okay so when you have an isotope or you have some sort of um, radium or cobalt or uranium something like that that's naturally occurring radiation okay you can't turn it on or off you can't control it it is what it has a half-life so forth this is closer to a radio signal in other words just like a radio can't transmit radio waves unless it's turned on and transmitting and energized so also can this x-ray tube not produce radiation unless it is energized so I'm not being radiated right now even if this tube had been just used a minute ago I would be in no danger because the high voltage wires are not connected and there is no high voltage passing through the tube right now so that's something that a lot of people ask about it's not radioactive okay I can run this thing all day long and as soon as it turns off there's no radiation okay it doesn't radiate anything it's not like if you take a magnet and stick it on a piece of metal and rub it and then that metal becomes magnetized this doesn't radioactivate something is that a word so I hope you learned a little bit about this x-ray tube and how a tube works I'll probably do some more things and show you some more uh, when we talk about how we control this x-ray tube okay uh, the, 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 the big power supply that drives this is called the x-ray generator and it's very can be very complicated to get the different forms of radiation we need so that's uh, we'll get into that on another maybe on another video there's one last thing I want to show you I told you in the beginning of this that this is a diode tube and it is a diode okay but some of these are actually triodes they actually have a control grid in them okay uh, there are some instances where we need to pulse the x-ray on and off very quickly and we use a control grid to do that just like you would use a grid in a radio tube or an amplifier tube or something to turn that tube on and off or to control the output of the tube okay and in some instances we need a tube to drive that that grid okay that grid can have up to four or five kV on it so I just so happen to have something else that I thought you'd find interesting <laughs> there there it is a big old tetro tube that weighs about 20 25 pounds um, that's solid copper the inside is copper and if I can show you here if you look inside there there's that see a deposit on that anode this tube had a little accident so it's really not any good anymore but this is out of a cardiac catheterization laboratory or a cath lab um, anybody that's had a bypass surgery or had a cardiac cath done on their heart cath done has been on a machine similar to this one okay this tube actually controls that 150,000 volts and actually can be con is controlled by this this takes the place of a grid in a grid tube okay so there's some that you have the grid in the tube and they're good for certain things and then there's some systems where we just turn the whole signal on and off wholesale and we we have basically our high voltage goes in you got your cathode end and your anode end and you have your or cathode end anode end you have your filaments okay and you have your grid and your grid is actually about a 4 kV turn on for the grid or turn off I should say negative 4,000 volts so even the grid voltage on these things uh, I know some of you that work on radios you take your finger and you touch the grid you know grid caps and stuff don't, don't do that on this one <laughs> you only do it once um, 
this tube would normally be submerged in a great big tank of oil and that oil is about the size tank of oil is about the size of a washing machine um, weighs about a half a ton and the transformers that drive this are massive um, have over a mile of wire on the secondary winding to produce that high voltage um, what I'm showing you here is pretty old technology these are no longer used um, modern technology we use IGBTs and we use high frequency inverters and we produce our high voltage with high frequency much smaller much comp more compact more efficient so but I always thought this was just too cool to get rid of so anyhow that's just a very very skimming the surface um, idea of x-ray we could talk a whole lot about you know the history of it and the science of it but this should give you a basic understanding okay I'm back had to cut out for a little bit for some family time here anyways I'll leave you with this one last epic idea I've had I've just not known anybody that have had the guts or the, or the time to try it but for all you guitar players out there think about it how many watts can these put out if we took all that KV and we wound a transformer to match the impedance of that 150 kV power supply down to an 8 ohm load of course that would be a massive transformer what kind of guitar amp could we make out of this thing I think it would be awesome anyways um, if you all like this video please let me know leave me some comments um, give me some thumbs up and uh, if I see any interest I'll do some further videos about how an x-ray generator works maybe we'll do some videos on site of some equipment and show it in action and we can even maybe get into some of modern x-ray how a digital x-ray machine works and a few things like that so uh, that's it for now hope you enjoyed it I tried to keep it as simple as possible maybe we'll get into a, a more detailed explanation of x-ray and so forth um, later on all right, that's it for now.